Good afternoon, everyone. So a long, long time ago, like a long time ago, there was no internet. And an even longer time ago, there was no radio. The advent of radio waves made it possible to communicate instantaneously across the world. And so prior to World War II, the Germans realized, well, if we have high-tech radio communication, we need high-tech encryption methods. Especially when you're sending messages related to the important battlefield decisions. You don't want those to be intercepted. While other countries were working on this, the Germans were the first to actually... In, oh, that's not me. There we go. In, the Germans were the first to invent this machine. It's called the Enigma. And this instrument is essentially looks like a typewriter uh, with a keyboard. And what you do is you input your message, and it outputs gibberish. You can then send your gibberish mes message over the radio. And on the other hand, you have another group of people. And they input the gibberish, and out comes the real message. So essentially, this complicated encoder is able to ensure that your information is private. Well, World War II is over. But there's still some encoding that needs to be done. But this time, it's at the molecular level. And the scientists are the ones who are at war. Our body is an increasingly complex system made up by multi-organs. And layered over various tissues, you have millions of cells that work together to communicate in, an, in, a, in a very complex ecosystem. And if one of these players takes a misstep, this can result in a whole slew of health problems and disease. It is when we can identify these rogue molecules that we can call them biomarkers. And these are essentially indicators of ongoing biological processes. When we can identify these markers, we can prepare and plan for the proper course of action and intervene when it is most appropriate. And most of you are probably more familiar with this than you may think. When you go to the doctor's office and you have your blood drawn, your blood is, and they tell you, well, come back in a few days, or we'll call you in a few days with results. Well, during that time, your blood is sent off in a little package to a lab where they're able to perform a wide variety of tests and screen for molecules like cholesterol and glucose. And these have a good indication of whether you're at risk for heart disease or diabetes. But biomarkers are not exclusively for the doctor's office. They are also available for at-home use. The most common example is that of a pregnancy test at home, where a small, the presence of a hormone in your urine can cause an indicator to turn pink and indicate that your, your family is going to change. But the mission for biomarkers, the, the, the goal of identifying biomarkers for SD decoding for the body, it's not even close to being finished. One such example is ovarian cancer. When detected early, ovarian cancer patients have a 94% of survival beyond the first five years. That's pretty good. But in the, the other remaining people, it, the outlook is incredibly grim. Only 20% of cases of ovarian cancer are actually detected early enough. And that's just not good enough. And it's not alone. This is just one example. This is just one disease that, I, that I'm mentioning. Neurological disorders make up an entire category of disorders where biomarkers are currently underserved. And this ranges, this includes diseases like dementia, autism, ADHD, depression, and addiction. In my lab at the University of Georgia, we focus on understanding neurological disorders such as addiction, which is characterized as a chronic relapsing disorder um, given by uncontrollable drug seeking despite harmful consequences to yourself and others. And with that, we focus on the brain. And our, we study a specific class of molecules called lipids, which are essentially fats. You may use them as oils in your home for cooking, or um, you, know, you have good foods that are high in fats. But these fats in the brain and in the body have incredibly important physiological roles. Studies have shown that lipids play a big role in mediating some of the responses to addiction. Um, these include terms like synaptic plasticity and neuromodulation. And our research has the hypothesis that in the brain, within, a region, within specific regions, such as the hippocampus, a region involved in learning and memory, that lipids play a role in regulating some of the responses to drug abuse. 
and then we can exploit understanding these limits as biomarkers for addiction. This would include is some questions like, is someone vulnerable to addiction in the first place? Are they likely to relapse? These lipids are differentially expressed throughout the region, like I mentioned from the campus. Learning and memory, we think of that when we learn new things in school. But learning and memory are really important to drug thinking in the first place. You learn to associate drug reward behaviors and memories, and those become reinforcing in your brain. The bigger goal of this is, can the lipids that we identify in the brain, can we use as biomarkers? Most people are not going to want their brain to be isolated during the doctor's visit. So we screen for these lipids in the blood as well, and see that if we look to see whether we can identify these messengers downstream. So let me walk you through a scenario. Let's say we have lipid X, and we want to see how it is regulated. We have three possible outcomes. If we were to compare an addicted individual's lipids to a non-addicted individual's. The first outcome is that in the addicted individual, these lipid levels would increase. Another scenario, it would just stay exactly the same, which would sort of imply that it's exactly the same between addictive and non-addictive, that it's probably not being affected by the addictive state. The third outcome is that it decreases. Now, regardless of whether it increases or decreases, though either way, we're interested in that, because it's a change. It's a change from the normal. So that sounds pretty simple, right? Let's look at these lipids, see if they change. Let's look at lipid X. So here's the thing, lipid X is just one of hundreds of thousands of lipids throughout your body and your tissues. So how do we know which one to investigate? How do we know which one to go after in specific disease states? Well, the approach that we use in our lab is a quick and dirty method called the shotgun approach. And essentially, it is the analytical analysis of thousands of lipid species simultaneously. You analyze them all at the same time and you hope that one will stick and have a meaningful relationship within your disease state. Using this approach, we have identified a few lipid candidates that may have promise within the context of addiction. Shown here is just one of them. <coughs> now, before we focus on this, we're studying the brain. I'm not at the point where I'm isolating human brains, but I am working with rodent models. Rats are a good behavioral model for addiction. So we try to mimic the condition that we see in people, where we model things called like relapse and abstinence. Um, and so once we are able to establish that behavioral paradigm, we can then assess their brain and see how the addictive brain has changed. So shown here is just a section, like a little cut of the brain within a rat, with a non-user in a drug in a drug user. And this lipid species is called the phosphatidyl 386. That's just a fancy name for, for the molecular structure of it. If you look at this image, you'll see that there it is on a color gradient. Now, the bluer colors indicate lower levels of the lipid, where the red and pinks indicate higher levels of the lipid. And throughout the entire brain section, in the drug user, we have a complete obliteration of that. And that's really interesting because that, the, I should be clear here, clear here, this is not whether you've used the drug or not. This is a persistent change that has permanently changed in the brain. Biomarkers truly have the potential to transform the field of healthcare by making it more personalized for patients, by using your body as a metric for disease progression. And if we're able to decode the human body, we can be there to make better change for the future. Thank you.